You just thank you. feel free. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, and thank, thank, thank you indeed. There was absolutely no need to uh, apologize at all. Uh, <clears throat> I had a very interesting time uh, in Abu Dhabi Airport. Uh, so I was talking a little bit about what do I think uh, might uh, be present in a school that encourages its students uh, and uh, its staff to flourish. And from my perspective, these are the things that I think are really key. So let me just talk a little bit uh, about those for the moment. So the ones in orange are the foundation of uh, the whole thing. So attitudes, uh, I think, uh, I hope, are pretty uh, obvious. Uh, in other words, it's the approach we take uh, in life, how we approach things, as demonstrated by uh, our behaviors. So our attitudes are generally um, uh, manifested by, the how, by how we approach things. Uh, and it's really important, I think, for students, whether they're very young children or older students, to learn behaviors and attitudes early. Uh, not just to learn what's expected of them, but to learn how they can express themselves uh, in a sensible way. The second is to do with achievements, and uh, you wouldn't be surprised if uh, achievement was not part of a necessary and central part of a school. Of course, students are there to, to learn. By achievement, I don't merely mean examination results. So examination results are a very narrow definition uh, of achievements. I mean something much broader than that. So I mean what they do outside of lessons, what they do in sports, in music, in drama, in social action, in charitable fundraising, in setting up uh, clubs or societies, whether that's a Model United Nations or, or a, uh, a, a women's group or whatever it might be. In other words, any achievement that an individual wishes to pursue, that is something we need to encourage and celebrate and be really careful that we don't denigrate one achievement against another. They're all achievements, and what's important is that those achievements belong to the individual. So the value we attach to them is really important. Agency is the next. By that I mean we ought to be creating young people, we ought to be forming young people who can change the world. They must have the agency to do that. Thank you. And it's a fairly obvious thing, but we probably forget it on the day-to-day -day busyness uh, of our lives. If we don't demonstrate to young people, whether they're three-year-olds or 19-year-olds, how they can change the world, their own microcosm world, it might be them and their family, it might be their school, it might be their community, it might literally be the world. If we don't demonstrate that to them, and give that to them as an aspiration, then I suggest we're failing. And then on top of those come the other things. In the UK in particular, and it's probably the same here, the most disadvantaged students in the UK do not have a network of people that they can go to for support throughout their lives. Affluent, privileged people like ourselves take our network of people for granted. We know that if we aren't sure of something, we can find somebody who can help us. We know that as we're progressing through our career, that we can make connections with others who've already been there. If I'm wanting to be a doctor, I can go and get some practice or some work experience in a, in a hospital. The most disadvantaged children in this world don't have those networks. And we've provide them, and we've got to demonstrate to them how you profitably and sensibly use your networks, not just in climbing the greasy pole of promotion, but in life. Because it's when, at, when, it's, it's when you're at your lowest, either professionally or personally, that you need those networks. Ethical behavior is a fairly obvious thing. I would hope most of your institutions are based on very explicit values. 
And those values are underpinned by an ethical approach to life, and those values are demonstrated by the way you behave uh, and the way your staff behave. Knowledge is fairly obvious. There is no power without knowledge. That's why the US charter movement, one of the most successful groups, is called KIPP. Knowledge is power. Skills as well. The most important skill, I think, of which is the knowledge or the skill of asking great questions and having the courage to ask them. And well-being. That's what we're talking about today. So for me, if I was designing a school, and I have designed a number of schools, those have got to be there. In the best schools I see around the world, those things are there. Possibly not using those words, but they're there. They're in the DNA of the institution. So let me move on. What are our needs in terms of well-being? Well, there are lots of different um, bits of research that you can uh, look at, if you like. They all fundamentally say the same thing. So I'm going to show you a few. So here's one which is essentially related to the action for happiness, great dream that I was talking about before. Our need as an individual, as a person, whether a child or an adult, uh, encompass those three things. So in other words, autonomy, our ability to determine what we do, to have choices, if you like. The most disadvantaged people in the world don't have choices. They simply react. They cannot decide. They have those decisions forced upon them. It might be as simple as, I have to get enough food today to survive. Relatedness, we were talking about before, connection with other people, uh, and mastery. So as a teacher or as a school principal, you are an expert. You're a master of what you do. You may not be perfect, that's different. The difference between perfect and being masterful. Hands up, who's perfect in this room? No one. Wow. I am surprised. Not. So, those three things are related to our needs and well-being. Bear in mind, I'm talking about you and your staff. If those three things are not there for your staff, then don't expect them to be giving of their best. Okay? Another model is uh, uh, coined like this, PERMA, uh, and the photograph is, is of... Um, Professor Dr. Seligman, Marty Seligman, he's the guru of positive education. Uh, he works out of uh, the University of Pennsylvania. And if you look at, uh, if you Google, uh, other search engines are available. Uh, if you look up PERMA, then you'll see that he's coined it in this way. I'm not going to go through them, but you can see they're pretty similar. And of course, the business of investing in happiness isn't just fluffy. There's lots of research that shows if you do this as a corporation, as a school, as a business, if you invest in this, you will get a financial return. You will be a more robust financial organization. There's an example that I put in for the school that I ran. So if we got it absolutely right, we could save ourselves 200,000 pounds. I left before getting it absolutely right. But there we are. I'm sure somebody else will. Uh, so there's a very, very great business case. So what can we do to be even happier at work? What can you do to allow your, enable your, your staff to be even happier at work? Well, you might try these things. So you might resolve publicly. Our mission is to create more happiness and less misery. Fairly highfalutin. Doing kind things for others, which of course is contagious. There's a great book called Contagious about exactly this. 
create an action for happiness group at your school. Hand it over to your staff. How can we be happier? Because they will do it much better than you. And they will own it and drive it. Find things every day that you can be grateful for. Someone very kindly, I can't remember who it was now, very kindly came up to me this morning when I arrived and said, I am so grateful for you coming here today. Thank you. Guess how that made me feel? About ten times taller than I actually am. And all of those hours in Abu Dhabi just melted away. So find things. We're not good at it because we think it makes us vulnerable. Find ways of showing your gratitude. You're much better at it, I'm sure, than I am. I'm a stuffed-up Western male. If you can do it, do it face-to-face. There's a great study run by Marty Seligman who got all his graduate students to write a letter to somebody they were grateful to. They wrote their letters, they brought them in, they talked through their letters with Professor Seligman, and then guess what he asked them to do? He said, go and read that letter to the person you're writing it to. Do it face to face. And guess what the impact of that was? It was huge. Huge both on the person who is delivering the thanks and the gratitude and on the person who is receiving it. It is contagious. Look for good, my colleagues. My goodness, that's hard to do sometimes, isn't it? Find the good in people. Yeah, particularly if they're screaming at you or moaning at you or complaining. Trying to get mindfulness into the day. You can do that as a whole school. You can do mindfulness as a whole school. You could do it in assembly. You could do it in the staff room. You could do it at the beginning of every lesson. You could do it anywhere. And trying to find people's strengths and focusing on them rather than always reminding them of their weaknesses. You've got to improve there. You're no good. You've got to improve there. You're no good. How motivating is that? It's not. Yeah? You're never good enough. That's not motivating. You're great at that. Why don't you get better? Let me help you get better. Why don't you do more of that? Wow. Big difference. So, I want to talk a little bit about, I'm going to whiz through those, uh, about how you might do that. These slides are all available. There's a very simple link, which I've discovered. I'm a very, very slow learner. I've discovered over 30 years. There's a very simple link, I think, between how you motivate people uh, and get the best out of them and knowing them as well. And it's, it's described in these connections here. So often we look at how people behave and how they behave determines the climate around them. In other words, how people feel working for them or in their team or in your school. If you're the school leader, you determine the climate in that school. You determine how you feel and more importantly, you determine how others feel. So your behavior does that. Determines the climate. That climate determines how much effort people are prepared to to put in to their job. How much effort they put in determines the impact they have. It's very, very simple. But you'll see on the left of behaviors, there's something else. Because your behaviors, whether you are conscious of it or not, your behaviors and those of anybody else are entirely determined by how you feel. Your feelings drive those behaviors. And if you're trying to help people to be better versions of themselves, then you've got to understand how they feel. You've got to get beneath the behaviors and try and understand them. 
And that's what I'm going to try and show you how you can do it. Before we do that, I just want you to think quietly for yourself, or you can discuss it with the person next to you if you like. I want you to think about the best boss you have ever worked for. They might well be in this room, in which case we're not giving any names. Okay? The best boss that you have ever worked for. What did that person do that means you describe them as your best boss? And how did that make you feel? Just one minute. Person next to you. You do have to talk, by the way. Think of your best boss. What did that person do, he or she? How did it make you feel? Who'd like to hazard something? Do not give me a name. What did your best boss do that made you feel, and how did it make you feel? Yep. Please. Okay, so he believed in your potential. How did that make you feel? Um, I think it made me feel much greater, much better. Okay, so so it gave you confidence, presumably. Anybody else? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Doesn't matter where it is. Anybody else going to be courageous and, and give me an example? Your best boss. You're all thinking of the converse now. Your worst boss because that's much easier. Your best boss. Yes, sir. Uh, this is like uh, when back to the uh, year 2006. Uh, 2006, like yesterday to me. Yeah. So, uh, it looks like, but then uh, I had a boss who gave me the opportunity to try out anything and everything. Because he said that I have faith in you so that you can do and deliver. Oh, key thing. He said to you, I have belief in you. Yes. How did that make you feel? That made me feel wonderful. That's why I've been doing the same thing. Brilliant. So you've picked and you've run with it. Okay? So, go on. Yes, please. Um, I remember I took a position at one of the professional colleges. And uh, while I was uh, studying, uh, my best boss was my uh, owner of the institute. Gave me the opportunity. Okay, so he spotted something in you, particularly to do with communication, and he gave you opportunity. Yes. Okay. So none, none of you have said to me, my best boss is great at spreadsheets. My best boss is a great time manager. My best boss is really good at keeping the office tidy. All of the things that you talk to me about, and indeed when I ask other people about this, they're all to do with how your best boss relates to you and understands you. So just think conversely, your worst boss, they might be in this room, no names, they might well be the same person, uh, but your worst boss, that person did what? And how did it make you feel? I suspect what you'll say to me is they didn't allow me freedom to get on with my job, might be a good example. They micromanaged. Every time I went off and did a project and it didn't go in precisely the way that person wanted, they came in and took over. That might be a good example. And of course, how does that make you feel? It makes you completely undermined. It undermines your confidence. It doesn't give you any incentive to go away and do things. So your best boss, typically, is someone who understands you and connects with you and tries to find things to help you. Yes, sir? Me? Yeah. My best boss is most compassionate one. And I always remember my best boss. boss. Go on. 
I always remember my best boss and I never forget my worst boss. Well, uh, that's a really good thing. Could you just explain to me how did your best boss show compassion? What did he or she do? He, he took it me as a family member okay. in confidence and sharing and caring. Great. He drew you in. And yes. He, he treated you as a family member. Fantastic. So my key point is, I'm always going back to what did these people do and how did it make them, how did it make you feel? Because it's how you behave which determines the climate around you. Nothing else, because that's what people see. We can't get into your heads. We can't mind read. We love to be able to mind read. But we can't do that. It's how you behave. That's what people see, and that's what they react to. Okay, so let's move on. Anybody like to tell me who might have said that? I'll give you a clue. It's a businessman in this case. He certainly used to run and still owns an airline. A chap called Richard Branson, typically people don't leave organizations when they're fulfilled. They might move on for promotion because there's no opportunity, but typically they don't leave organizations when they're fulfilled. They leave because of their relationship with their boss. Well, guess what? You are the boss. So people will leave your organization or stay because of you. That's a huge responsibility. But it's one well worth remembering. If you want to hang on to the best people you've got, then you've got to be the best boss you can possibly be to them. So you've got to find out what that means to them. It's no good being the best boss you think you should be, because that's irrelevant. What's relevant being the best boss you can be to the York star. Here's another one. English graduates should get this. Anyone? I'm teasing, aren't I? American woman died uh, probably two years ago. Civil rights activist. Uh, not Marion Quiet White, no, Maya Angelou. Maya Angelou, sorry, but, Maya Angelou. But yeah, very yeah, close. Of course. The poet, yes. Yeah. Indeed, yeah. So people forget what you do, they forget what you say, just as you'll forget everything I've said today by tomorrow. They never, never forget how you made them feel. Never. Compassion. Yeah? They never forget it. Now, that can work, work positively and negatively, of course. Uh, I will reveal today, I left my last job because of my boss and how he made me feel. Don't tweet it, please. Because I still want to have a relationship with him. Uh, but it's true. Actually, he knows because I told him. Uh, and, uh, and I'm having lunch with him in a couple of weeks, and I will tell him again. Uh, the interesting thing is he wants to learn from it, which is great. Those two things I have had up on my wall, or metaphorically in my mind, throughout my leadership. And those two things drive me all the time. All the time. Okay, so let's quickly add a few things. So relationships are, are contextual. So your context is different from the person next to you. Your school's context is different from the school down the road. So they are contextual. But so you've got to ask yourself, what is your context? And how does that make, match with your capabilities? So if you're new to school leadership or new to the job or the role, 
you'll be feeling pretty uncomfortable because just like I am, currently I've started a new job on Monday of this week. I'm a complete fraud. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm expected to do. So I'm feeling fairly vulnerable uh, at the moment. Okay? You may well be in that situation as well. Uh, <coughs> that would drive you to feel in certain ways. So I'm feeling vulnerable. And that, those feelings will come out in your behavior. Okay? <coughs> those behaviors result from your feelings, as I've said, and the climate that exists around you is entirely determined by your behaviors. If you don't believe it, go and ask people in your team how it feels to be in that team. Ask them the same questions I've just asked you. How does my behavior make you feel? Describe the behaviors to me, and how does it make you feel? And if they don't tell you, honestly, that indicates something. It indicates they don't trust you. Okay? I'm going to talk about building trust shortly. So, let's know, uh, so that is uh, the context. This is uh, to do with how we learn. I'm going to whiz through this because it's reasonably theoretical and not terribly exciting. But we do things in terms of concrete experience. Students do this as well. In other words, uh, if you want to learn how to build with Lego, then you don't talk about it in theory. You go away and build with Lego. Uh, you observe sometimes and you reflect. So that's probably what you're doing today. You're observing uh, people. You're listening to what they're saying. Uh, and you're reflecting on it. Uh, and hopefully you might use it. Uh, and we then go away and we form uh, models or abstracts in our own mind, uh, and we test them out in new situations. We try it out. Now, some of us naturally default to one of those. So I, I naturally default to experimentation. Yeah, I just want to get on and do it. Who here has constructed a flat pack piece of furniture? Possibly you have people to do them, I don't know. But if you get a flat pack piece of furniture or a kit, most people either throw the instructions to one side, <coughs> excuse me, and try and give it a go, or they'll get the instructions out and they'll line up every item of the piece of furniture or the kit and they'll check that everything is there according to the instructions. They'll read the instructions, go through it step by step by step. Uh, then they'll try step one, they'll go back to the instructions. In other words, they don't experiment, they follow the menu. And we all default to one thing or other. But we all go through this cycle. We all have to do this cycle. But you will have a default. So what's your default? What's your preferred position, I think, is one of the things I would ask you. And of course, your colleagues will also have that default. And it may not be yours. And therefore, you may clash. So whilst you may want to do things in a certain way, they may prefer and default to doing things in a different way. And if you're not aware of that, that can cause difficulty. Yeah? So quickly through it. How we, uh, how we think about uh, things is perception. How we do things is process. Uh, perception is basically head and heart. So are you a heart person or are you a head person? You're probably somewhere in between. Uh, and in terms of doing, do you watch and reflect, or do you just get on with it? Now, all people cycle through these things. Students do it as well. And the question is, are you aware of it? Because it defines to a certain extent. It doesn't define. It just means that you behave in certain ways if you're not aware of other ways of doing things. And I want to just quickly look at those other ways. Uh, the um, defaults, rather. They are described like this. I'm not going to talk about the titles particularly. Uh, but look at how people behave if they're in one of these categories. So if you're an accommodator, then your strengths are getting things done, leadership, risk-taking. If there's too much of that approach in your behavior, then the problem is that you might just get trivial things done. 
I've got to get things done. I don't really care what it is I've got to get done. I've just got to get things done. Okay? So that's the typical behavior of an accommodator. If you're a diverger, you're an imaginative person. Yeah? You like imagination. You like creativity, brainstorming, those sorts of things. Oh, I've got another idea. No, let's not do that idea, because I've got another one. Uh, no, I've, I've got another one now. Let's not do that one. Well, if you're an accommodator, saying, I've got to get things done, 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 and over here, you've got your diverger saying, oh, no, let's have another look at another idea. Let's do some more brainstorming. How do you think those two people working together feel? They'll be pretty peed off unless you control it as the leader. Unless, of course, you're one of the accommodators or the diverger. Okay? Uh, and then the other, the other two, the process, uh, converger, problem solving, decision making, deductive reasoning, an excess of that, you solve the wrong problem, you make the hasty decision, uh, those sorts of things. And if you're an assimilator, planning, creating, etc. But you might be planning things that are 10 years away. Oh, let's have a visioning day about what you know, the institution might look like in, uh, in the 30, 30th century. Yeah. Again, if you default to those behaviors, then working with somebody who doesn't share them can be quite difficult. doesn't mean you can beha can't behave in other ways. You can learn to behave uh, in other ways. Okay? So, if you're a diverger and a converger, you might chair a meeting differently. Yeah? A converger will say, we've got this agenda and I'm getting through it. It doesn't matter whether we make good decisions or timely decisions. I've got an agenda. I'm getting through it. And a diverger may want spend lots of time being creative, brainstorming, etc. Yeah? Same might come out in terms of reacting to new ideas. Some people say, just give me the detail. Tell me what I've got to do. And others are saying, well, actually, we haven't quite worked out that detail yet, but don't worry about it. Yeah, we'll work it out as we go. And a really good indicator of what the default learning style of people is, is how they write email. So, some people will write an email that says, oh, hello, how are you today? I hope you're feeling well. How are the children at home? Did you have a nice weekend? And they'll go on for about a page or two before they get to the issue it is that they want to discuss. They might then go on for another three or four pages uh, and at the bottom of the paragraph, they might ask you to do something. Okay? And then other people might say, Mike, great idea, get on with it. And they're responding to the same issue. Okay? And you, as receiver of that email, might take those two things completely differently. If I got the first email, I'd be up the wall. I'm not interested in how I spent the weekend and all that. So just tell me what you want. Yeah. That's not for me. <clears throat> Whereas if some people got the second email, they'd be really cross. How does that person know me? a really good indicator. Next time you get an email, think about the person who's sending it and why they're sending it in that way. Email's a really dangerous thing. I had a rule in my school that we would never use email for anything other than communicating information. If you had to communicate emotion, anger, frustration, whatever, then go and have a face-to-face -face meeting. Okay. So, relationships and context, there we are. 50 to 70% of the climate that you create in your school is as a result of your behavior. Mostly unconscious behavior. Mostly unconscious. You're not aware of it. People are picking up on your behavior. Okay? 
I want to just talk a little bit about team dynamics as well. You might be very familiar with this, particularly if you're taking on a new team now, or indeed new team members are joining uh, your team or your school. Uh, you can predict how teams are going to shift over time, how long it takes to go through this process, and how deep the trough is entirely depends on you as the team leader. But the first, start, uh, first point of uh, team dynamics is that the team comes together. You literally come together. You meet for the first time. I haven't yet met my team that I'm going to be working with uh, in my new job. I'm doing that uh, on Tuesday when I arrive back in the UK. Uh, and we'll be sitting there forming. And guess what's going on there? Well, I, uh, they're trying to suss me out. They're trying to work out who is this person, how does he behave, what does he want. And I'm trying to work them out. So we're just forming. It's all pretty tentative. It's like dating. Yeah, it's exactly the same probably as stressful, okay? You're trying to work out how do I fit into that group of people. The second is storming. Right, we've now worked out. We now have a working relationship, but I don't agree with the way you want to do things. Uh, and I don't like people standing on my territory. So I'm going to exert myself. So it's pretty stormy, potentially doesn't mean it's necessarily unpleasant, but it's utterly predictable. If you've got a new team, it will go through this cycle. The third is norming. In other words, everybody now understands what it is that you're trying to do, and you're beginning to do that more or less on autopilot. Yeah, it's that stage I got to where people would come in and say, Mike, I'm going to do this. I don't need your approval, because I already have it. I'm going to do it. Okay? Uh, and the Third, then, is performing. No doubt you all work in high-performing organizations where everyone knows what they're supposed to do. They all behave in the way you expect them to behave. They work with initiative, uh, and everything is perfect. If you do, let me know, because I'd like to come and visit. Uh, and what you can say uh, very, very clearly is, unless you do something at that performing stage, then you will get to the next stage. So if you're in a high-performing organization now, then you've got to start reforming. Otherwise, it will happen by itself. Yep, you won't have control of it, and you won't know when the dip starts, uh, and you will get into the morning stage. And this is a classic example in commercial world uh, <coughs> where companies collapse because they haven't done the reforming. Always going to happen when new members join your team. So there's an opportunity. It will happen whether you like it or not. There's the opportunity. But even if you haven't got new members joining your team or your school or your organization, then you should make it happen and plan for it to happen. Okay? That's my task starting on Tuesday to reform the organization uh, I'm taking over as Tuesday. Okay? Utterly predictable question is, where is your institution or your team on that curve now? So in your own mind, where would you put your team now? In the forming stage, in the storming stage, in the norming stage, or in the reforming stage? I hope not in the morning stage. Okay? All right. I talked about trust earlier. Trust is the key thing in leadership. If people do not trust you, then they will not follow you. And the higher the trust you can get, the greater you're going to get in terms of engagement of the people, whether they are employees or pupils, students or parents, or the community that you work in. Okay? It's not linear, uh, but uh, it is a very clear relationship. And if you want to know, well, how do I get people to trust you, uh, it's easy. You've got to have these elements. Okay? So there's the equation, top right-hand corner. Let me unpack that for you a little bit. So the first is to do with credibility. So are you a credible leader? Well, probably you are. If you've got to where you are now, you were a great teacher, no doubt. Uh, if you're just new to leadership, then 
Yeah, there's a little doubt about your credibility, I guess, until you've demonstrated your ability to lead as well as be a great teacher. If you're an experienced principal, uh, then your credibility as an experienced principal probably is quite high. I think after 13 years of being a head teacher or a principal uh, in the UK, my credibility was high, and, uh, and uh, that was really helpful. Now moving to a new job, I have zero credibility, because I've never done that job before. Uh, and it's not a role that I've done before. So my first task, moving into that job, is to demonstrate my credibility to people. Uh, in other words, uh, I'm a credible spokesperson for the organization. I don't say stupid things. I go back to research. I get the detail right. All of those sorts of things. I know what it is that the people who employ me are looking for. The second is reliability. In other words, I do what I say I'm going to do. So no one said to me, uh, on many other occasions they have, have said to me, my worst boss was really unreliable because they never did what they said. They never delivered on their promises or they backtracked. Okay? So are you reliable? Do you do what you say you're going to do? Now, you can be a good leader with just those two elements, credibility and reliability. You cannot be a great leader without the third, and that's intimacy. Intimacy doesn't mean revealing your innermost secrets. It means having a connection with the person that you're leading. Not with the group of people, with the individual that you are leading. It means having that personal connection. And you can do that really easily. You can simply listen to them. That's all I do. As a head teacher at lunchtime, I would go into the dining room. I'd sit at a table, quite deliberately sit at different tables every day to sit with different people, unless I was utterly exhausted, in which case I'd just find somebody who understood I didn't want to talk, and I'd sit with them. And there are plenty of those. But I'd sit with somebody, I'd simply ask them questions. What have you been doing today? That's the only question you need to ask. And then you listen. And you get the whole story. You get not only what have they been doing today, but how are they feeling? How does that fit into the context of their family? How does that fit into the context that they've got aged parents at home that they've got to look after? Or they've got to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning to do something in order to, feel, to prepare for the day to then go off and do their job. How does that fit in? Uh, and I would just clock things away. I had a connection with people. So I knew that if that person was under pressure, then I could find ways of trying to at least alleviate that pressure in their working lives. And the fourth element there is what's described as self-orientation. I prefer the word selfishness. So are you in the job you're in for self-promotion? Or are you there because of other people? Because it's very easy, isn't it? It's very, very easy to see through people who are climbing the greasy pole of promotion, and they will step on anybody and anything in order to get up to the next run. It's very easy indeed. I guess you don't trust them, and you're right not to. Very easy to see through people who are selfish. So if you want to build trust, you've got to have those three elements on the top and not undermine it by being selfish. Okay? So, how can you change the climate in your team? Well, there are various climate dimensions or uh, approaches that you can take. Uh, uh, and you can... Uh, easily promote a different climate by the way you behave. All right? I just want to talk about those uh, in a little bit. Or, indeed, by the way your staff behave or are behaving. Because it's to do with their behavior as well as yours. So the first is to do with uh, flexibility. So if you want happy, fulfilled staff who contribute without a second thought who turn up day after day after day because they want to, 
then you've got to have high levels of flexibility. Okay? If you specify what they must do every minute of their day and you provide no flexibility, then don't expect them to get very much out of them. Go and work for Amazon if that's what you want. Yeah? If you want to get the best out of people, then you've got to provide flexibility. And then they will be happy. That's what we're talking about. Okay? Flexibility is one. The second is responsibility. Real responsibility. I don't mean dumping a problem on somebody without any authority to do anything about it. So responsibility is a combination of responsibility, delegated properly, and authority, and autonomy. So ask them to develop this part of the curriculum. Give them some sort of guidance as to what you might together want it to look like, and then leave them alone. Give them support. Get them to check in periodically to make sure they're happy. Not that you're happy, but they're happy. Allow them that real responsibility. And don't blame them and castigate them if they get it wrong. If they get it wrong, it's your fault. Because you haven't provided the support and clarity that they need. Okay? If you blame them, they're not going to come back wanting more. They will simply go away and keep their heads down and just do what they have to do. There's a really good phrase that I use about effort or discretionary effort, um, as it's sometimes called. Discretionary effort in my book is doing anything over and above what you have to do not to get sacked. Anything over and above what you have to do not to get sacked. Yeah? That's discretionary effort. Well, that's 99% of what a teacher does. Don't take them to the point where they want to leave because you haven't supported them properly. Okay? Next dimension is standards. So is it clear what it is they're supposed to achieve? That might be time scale. It might be this, the, you know, the actual standard that they've got to achieve. You know, it might be financial management. It might be what, whatever it is, whatever the task is. Are the standards clear? And have they participated in that? Yeah, if you're asking an expert teacher to use their expertise to do something, and you haven't asked them what standard do you think we should achieve? Then we're completely undermining that person. Yeah? You haven't recognized them as experts. You've simply imposed something on them. Okay? Next one is rewards. That doesn't mean money. Just as well, because in teaching, there ain't much money. But it does mean recognition. It doesn't necessarily mean public recognition. It might mean private recognition. I'll tell you a, a very quick story. I very rarely handwrite anything these days, mostly done uh, on computer. But I do write to people when they're leaving the school, uh, not because of me, I hope, uh, but they're leaving because their family are moving or whatever it might be. And I wrote to one of the gardeners uh, of the school. He used to tend the garden outside my office. Uh, and I wrote to him just saying, thank you very much for looking after the garden. He's about 25. He wanted to be a a, a green keeper in a golf course. He found his dream job, and I said, great, fantastic, off you go. Thank you very much for, for what you've done. Uh, and a few months later, I met his mother, who I knew uh, in any case, and she said to me, Mike, the letter that you wrote to him, he framed my handwritten letter, and it's now in his hall as you go into his house. It was so important to that simple recognition made a huge difference to him. And I have to say, a huge difference to me. So small things of recognition are really, really, really important. And the final thing is to do with clarity. So I'm clear, or I, do you make it clear what it is you're expecting? 
And all of those combine to get what's known as team commitment, which is what we all want, of course. We want a committed team who know what they're doing and get on with and do it to the highest possible standard and enjoy what they're doing and live a happy, fulfilled life. Now, as I said before about uh, uh, you being good, you can be a good organization, you can be a good team if you just have clarity and standards. You can't be great. So people will do what you ask them to do. They'll do it to a good standard if you make it clear, but they won't be committed to the level that you probably want. You've got to have all of those dimensions. So the takeaway is, go away and think about your team, your organization. What level are those dimensions at? Which ones are strong? Which ones are weak? What is your opportunity to build up a strong team commitment by having all of those dimensions? Okay? So that's how you can affect the climate in your team or your organization. What we said earlier was the way you behave determines the climate that exists around you. Uh, and if you're really good, you will go out and ask people, what is the climate that exists around in our team? Tell me how I'm behaving and how that makes you feel. And they'll tell you a certain amount. So you've got a team. They can see you. You can see yourself. And you know a little bit about what they see and what you see. It's, a, it's common ground. Okay. What isn't quite so obvious is what is hidden by you to the team. So you might deliberately or unconsciously keep things from your team that you don't want them to know. So I don't typically talk uh, about my personal life uh, at work except with a few people I trust because I prefer to keep that that's a conscious decision on my part. But some people hide things unconsciously. And then, of course, and this is the really interesting thing, there are certain things that the team can see that you cannot. And that's where your ability to influence the team is at its greatest. You've got to find out what is in that blind spot. And the only way you can do that is to build trust and ask people. So I typically, in my last few years of uh, headship, I used to send out an uh, a online anonymous survey to all 350 employees in the school and, tell, and ask them, tell me about my leadership. I gave them some questions to guide them, but essentially I gave them an opportunity to give me free responses as well. And I got hundreds of responses. Uh, and they were really hard-hitting, some of them. Some of them made me weak, literally weak, because I didn't realize that's the impact I had on them. But it also gave me ammunition. It gave me the energy and ammunition to change my behavior. And you can change your behavior. You may have to fake it on occasions, but you can certainly change your behavior. And the last, of course, is the unknown. Unknown to you and unknown to other people. I guess one could call that potential. Okay? So do you know yourself, and are you getting reliable, repeatable data from others? If they're not telling you, they don't trust you. So you've got to build up the trust. You might like to explore this uh, website. It's an American website. Uh, again, if you want to pursue this or about yourself or about your team members, then you can do an online, very quick online character strength survey. They happen to be my top signature strengths. So I, I would never describe myself as having a top signature of forgiveness, but that's what it's out. And I guess that's true. I don't hold grudges. So the fact I've left my job because of my relationship with my previous boss I, doesn't worry me. Now I'm going to build a different relationship. I'm not going to hold a grudge against him. Yeah. He is the way he is, and I am the way I am, uh, and we'll have to find a different relationship. Do you know what your top character signatures, characteristics are? 
You might be able to guess. You might not be able to. Well, you can go and find out. They're reasonably stable. I've done this every year for the last five years. The top ones, there are 24 in total. The top ones don't change very much. They might change in order by a bit from year to year. But the top ones don't change. Um, so I know myself pretty well. And that means I know how I am likely to impact on people I work with. You can do it as a team, of course. So this was an analysis I did for a team uh, in August. Got the whole team to do the, uh, the strengths, and I just put it into this um, spreadsheet. So you can get an idea of what, is the, you know, what, the, what are the top strength, character strengths of the team that we are, we're working with here. Are there any that are missing? Are there any that are dominant? Are there things we can do? I'm not saying, suggesting you should appoint people on this basis or fill gaps in teams on this basis, but you've got information about how your team behaves. And then I want to talk about motives, because to the left of feelings, I talked about feelings and emotions, to the left of feelings are motives. Deep, often subliminal needs that you may, may or may not be aware of for yourself and for the people that you are leading. And the key one there is the red one. So unhealthy stress, stress can be healthy, unhealthy stress arises when those deep needs are not met. And I'm not talking about being met at work. These are deep subliminal needs, both in your personal and your professional life. They're about you as a person. Okay? I want to just talk briefly about them. If you haven't looked at the TED Talks by Simon Sinek on precisely this issue, then I would have a look. It's well worth looking at. If you describe people who are passionate, and there are lots in this room, then they're doing it because they love it. And it doesn't matter that it may be a demanding, challenging, stressful job. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Okay, motive, very quickly. So the first one is the need for achievements. Might be your own personal achievement, might be the achievement of your family, it might be the achievement of the students that you teach in your class, or the achievement of the students in your school. Uh, achievement, yeah. It might be in competition against another person, or it might be just being better than your previous best. So, you know, golfers typically are achievement driven. They want to get better than the last time they played. Or athletes are achievement driven. Team players tend to be achievement driven, but in the context of a team. You know, football players, for instance. Different between, the difference between ego and achievement. Okay? So where do you sit on that? You know, would you say you're very highly driven by achievement or moderately or lowly? Okay. Uh, you can see some of the behavioral characteristics or indicators for that. So if you like crosswords and doing hard to get stuff or running marathons. I've got a colleague who runs 12 marathons a year. I have no idea why. Well, I do, because he's utterly driven by his desire, his need to better his personal best. <clears throat> he's got a problem, of course, because he's getting older and older and older and older. So he's probably never going to do it. The next one is to do with affiliation. Your need for people. Not whether you like people or not, but your need to have lots of relationships, to have positive relationships, uh, and to put them over and above everything else. Okay? Where are you on that spectrum? High, medium, low. And the third is your need for power. Some people balk at the word power. I don't at all. I don't use it in a pejorative sense at all. You are all leaders in your institutions. You all exert power. I suspect you all rather like and need to exert power. I know that my, my, uh, one of my top personal needs is to exert power and influence. Guess why I became a head teacher? 
Guess why I'm going on to be the chief executive of a head teachers association. Guess why I'm here today. Because I can exert influence on you. Yeah? And that's my need. That's what drives me. And fortunately, I get all of that, or have got all of that need, has been provided to me by my professional life. I have no need for that at home at all which frustrates my wife, who wants me to make decisions and do things and uh, all those sorts. No, I just don't need it. I'm very happy for you to do it all. Okay, I just want to put those in context. So, if you think of a teacher in your school, their ability to achieve, this is the role of the teacher, not an individual, so the teacher role, the ability of a teacher in a school to drive achievement is modest. They can drive their own achievement. They can drive the achievement of their class. That might be, I don't know, 30, 40, 50, 100 people, something like that. It's relatively modest. Their need for, their, sorry, they're likely to be highly affiliative. The role is likely to be highly affiliative. So you want them to collaborate with other teachers. You want them to, uh, you know, in the, in the UK, they would typically, you know, go to a, uh, lunch together, or they'd go to the pub on Friday, they'd socialize together. So the role has a fairly high affiliative need, and it has a pretty low power profile. You know, an individual single teacher doesn't have much power yeah, in a school. Has some, but not much. So the role profile for a teacher in a school is, is going to look something like that. It might vary, you know, the size of the peaks, etc. It might look something like that. Okay? Let's just Assume it does for the moment. Now think of an individual teacher, a named individual. I've called her Julia. Her personal motive profile looks like this. So her personal needs exactly match the role of a teacher in her school. What are the consequences? What are the implications of that? To what extent will she be fulfilled and happy in her work? Yes? No? Yeah. She's likely to be highly fulfilled. Because her personal needs and her role are exactly match. So she's probably the person who comes to work at 4 a.m. and leaves at 10 p.m. And doesn't do anything outside of work. She's utterly fulfilled. Sounds great, doesn't it? We'd all like to be that. Julia has a partner. At home, she's got a partner. Does she need her partner? Does she need her partner? Completely fulfilled at work. She does not need a partner at all. She has one. So what are the implications of that? It's going to be a fairly rocky relationship. Potentially. It doesn't have to be, but potentially. Yeah? So we don't necessarily want the individual motive profile to match the role profile at all because we're talking about the person in their whole life, not just in their professional working life. Now, if you knew that about Julia, if you knew her role profile and her personal profile was like that, and you'd observe the fact she comes in very early and she leaves very late, and you knew she had a partner at home, she might even have children at home, I think you'd be worried. And I think I would certainly be saying to Julia, uh, this ain't going to work. Yeah? You're not going to be the best teacher we want and need you to be if you don't recognize what's happening. And sometimes it needs people like us to recognize what's happening. Well, Julia is a successful teacher. Uh, <coughs> she left her partner. It's fictitious, by the way. Uh, and she was promoted to be a head of subject. And that role profile is slightly different. So we want her to be slightly more distant, or the 
sister. The green line requires her to be slightly more distant from her colleagues. Uh, we want a middle leader to be more obsessed by achievement. Yeah, we want those exam results. We want those sport results. We want those great, that great music. Uh, and, uh, of course, in order to be able to do that, uh, she's got to exert power. What, what is the implication now? The personal profile for Julia hasn't changed. It's still the blue line. But look at the blue line compared to the green line. What's the implication for Julia now? Yeah, she, potentially there's a stress level there, isn't there? Uh, I don't know whether I've got a point to on this or not. Uh, if I have, it's not working. Okay, so if you look at the difference between the green line and the blue line on achievement, there's now a gap, isn't there? So she's not terribly turned on by achievement, but she has to be in her new role. So we've got to teach her how to be. And if you look on the right-hand side, the difference between the blue line and the green line and the power motive, there's a big gap there. She'll be really stressed and uncomfortable about exerting power. Think of a young teacher coming into a team that has highly experienced staff in that team. That's a really stressful thing. So we've got to teach her how to be a great leader and exert power and influence. If you're not doing that, then you need to think about how you're going to do it. And then look at the difference between the, blue, the green line and the blue line in the affiliation bit. Julia needs people. She desperately needs them to be fulfilled, and to be the best person she can be. She can't do that at work anymore to the same extent as before. So she's got to find that affiliation fix outside of work. And in the UK, that's typically, stereotypically, where women join book groups and men join sports clubs. Because they can go and get their affiliation fix playing golf or playing football or riding a bike or reading a book. Yeah, And it's not the activity which is important. It's the socialization which is important. And again, if Julia hasn't recognized that, then I'd be saying to his head, you need to go and find things outside of school that will give you this fix. OK? And then Julia continues to be successful. She becomes a middle leader. The gaps op open wider. So the need outside of the work environment gets larger. And classically, this is where then she becomes the chair of the book group, or the man becomes the chairman of the club. Uh, and uh, you may, she may even go on to be a high school principal or a head. And the profile, role profile for a high school principal or head probably looks something like that. It's known as the executive tick. So in other words, pretty low on affiliation, modest on achievement. That's interesting. And very high on power and influence. Anyone like to guess my personal motive profile? Which one of those? Which color do you think represents me as a person? Not the role, me as a person. Go on, have a go. Uh, Mike, yep. um, I think we're running really late on lunch, so what I propose okay. is the following. It's a proposal to all of you. Yep. I'm sure you want to hear the rest of what Mike has to say. Is that not so? OK. Uh, but you're also hungry. Yes. Is that not so? Yes. Well, what I've done is, in the meantime, sitting in the front, arrange your lunch right in the back here, like in that room, the lounge. So what I propose is a working lunch. Just quietly go there, get your lunches, and come back in. Then we can field some questions from you. Would that be all right? OK, so we'll make it a working lunch, an American-British lunch. So please feel free to go in there and get your lunch. Thank you. And just uh, Mike can continue. Should I pause? Uh, because you can actually hear them as uh, Mike as well in the back. Okay. No, 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 you continue. Uh, okay, I haven't they can just I, sneak out. Because I don't actually, think I've actually got very much more to do. They can hear in the back as yeah, well. That's fine. Okay. I'm happy to. I'm also hungry. Oh, yes, we uh, need you to, need yeah, you to no, be fed. Otherwise, I'm you'll on, never come back to India. I'm they say never fed me. They only made me talk. Oh, no, I'm currently on a diet. So, <laughs> so I used to be about twice the size I am. Um, ah, so that's amazing. Uh, twice the size, how many months ago? Oh, six months ago. Six months ago, twice the size, and now you're half the size. No, I'm exaggerating. I'm trying to motivate myself. Wow, it's pretty amazing, regardless. So, so you're, you're going to suggest which of those uh, might be me as a person? Excuse me, Mike. Just yep. uh, one more interruption from my side as well. Uh, 
the delegates are requested to please move to the back side that is the lounge side for uh, the lunch and the rest the staff members will go down to the main dining hall okay thank you very much thank you uh, very much so third time lucky which of the green you uh, think i'm green uh, i'm not no yep nope we'll get there eventually uh, blue, yeah, no, I am blue. Yeah. So I'm utterly driven. I'm not terribly interested in achievement at all. I learned to be as a head teacher. Doesn't mean you don't have to learn those things. But I'm not personally terribly interested in achievement at all. I don't need people. Uh, uh, I do have lots of friends, but I don't need them. Uh, but I am utterly driven by power influence. So that happens to be me. Okay. So the behaviors that we either default to or learn fall into these categories. We learn behaviors that are required by our context, and they need energy. So a new context, we've got to behave in slightly different ways. They definitely need energy. And then we have behaviors which are derived from our personal motives. They don't need energy. We default to them. They just happen. But we can learn to mix those two. Uh, and what we're trying to do, obviously, is to go into the middle somewhere. Because that's where joy exists. So joy is achieved when we combine behaviors we learn and the impact of those with behaviors we default to and the impact of those. And of course, if it's true for us, it's also true for the staff that we lead. We're trying to get them into that sweet uh, in the middle. Okay? So I'm going to leave that bit and jump to the last bit. I can come back to that if people want to, because that's the last slide. <clears throat> the last slide is the combination of all of those. So I've been talking about behaviors, learned and default behaviors on the left hand side. They break down into motives for achievement, for affiliation, and for power or influence. Those uh, motives determine how you feel or how other people feel. So it's true for you, it's true for other people. Those emotions and feelings determine how they behave. Those behaviors determine the climate in your team. And I've got the climate dimensions there. Uh, that climate determines the contribution people make, and all of that determines the impact it has on them and how happy they are. So our role as leaders is to make sure that we recognize all of those things and we get it into a virtuous circle. That was as much as I was going to say. So I will pause at that point. And I'm very happy to take questions uh, about anything or to talk over lunch if people would. Prefer. Right. So uh, regarding questions, firstly, I think we all understand that you've just left the position we advertised that you were coming from, yep. which is as head of um, Ashford School. Ashford, yep. uh, yeah, uh, School Unified District of Schools. And uh, that's a group of 50 schools uh, and 60, sorry, group of 60 schools with the best academic results in the UK. Now, that, some can you them, imagine? Yeah, some of them have. Some of them, yeah. of course, not each yeah. one of them, but not some everyone. of them. The yeah. best academic results in the UK. And then secondly, um, Mike is, has moved over because he didn't like his boss, which we are not supposed to tweet about. No, it's not, it's not that I didn't like him. Uh, yeah, we just weren't well paired. Oh, it just yeah. didn't go so well. Whatever, whichever. Both ways it could have been. We don't know. So, but nevertheless, <laughs> we assume that people leave their jobs because they're not happy with trouble. the boss. Yeah. And that's clear. You know, anyway, so uh, I almost left the World Bank because of one of my bosses. Um, anyway, uh, so he's now chief executive of HMC, which is the headmasters and headmistresses organization, and it's a global organization. So my question to you is, can we, the heads here, become members of this HMC? <laughs> That's my question. How expensive is it to become a member? Then what are the benefits? Okay, so, so uh, uh, 
there are criteria for membership, uh, and they're related to uh, both the person and the institution. So the person is the member, not the institution. Uh, and the criteria are to do with size of um, uh, uh, school, your uh, autonomy as a head, the, s the standards you reach in terms of uh, academic outcomes as well as other outcomes, uh, and then uh, 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 the, the, the softer criteria, I guess, are to do with the, the person. In other words, do you show the integrity and uh, skills we'd expect of somebody? Um, the answer is that there is an international division uh, and it's perfectly possible to uh, apply as an individual uh, to be a member, and then you would go through an accreditation process. Sure, we apply, we become a member, then what happens? Uh, well, then you become a member, and uh, uh, if, you're an, uh, if you're a member, you get access to uh, me, uh, but you also get, <laughs> you also get access to uh, all of the resources of the organization. So, for instance, we've just conducted... Uh, uh, we, have a, we have a major conference twice a year. I've just come from that major conference where all of the members have to attend, um, and therefore it's a great way of networking and sharing best uh, practice. Uh, and we also do quite a lot of research uh, as well. So we've just completed a, a research of the use of technology uh, by teenagers, uh, and we have data on about 20,000 uh, teenagers who responded to the survey telling us how they use it and what the dangers they are coming across are and how they manage them. So it's not just here's a problem, but we also say here are some solutions. Um, but we, all, you know, we also provide advice and guidance on things like the governance of schools, on the leadership of schools. We provide training for uh, staff coming through to headship and principalship, uh, all of those sorts of things. Okay, so I guess some of you might be interested in joining the HMC, right? Seeing Mike again, of course. Possibly in the UK, is that what it is? Or are they uh, held all over the world, these it, conferences? No, it's well, at the moment, it's primarily UK, but there are about 100 members over the world and uh, increasingly uh, in this part of the world. Okay, so can we expect that one day you can host an HMC conference right here in this hall? I hope we can host HMC conferences around the world. Yeah. Fabulous. Brilliant. Thank you. All right, so now open for questions. I suppose, are you finished or there's some more? No, no, that's it. I think okay. I've, I've said So, yeah. right. Questions from the floor, please. Um, there's a second mic. We need more mics. Yeah, there it is. Okay. I, I'm the first Two mic. more mics are here. So, uh, questions from the floor, please. Those who, are, who want, you know, those are here. Uh, any questions you have? I mean, what Mike has talked about is pretty phenomenal for me. I've been learning hugely sitting here. And, uh, you know, the whole happiness thing that happened yesterday is very synergistic to hear that again, that, you know, a happy place is a place where a lot of things happen. And uh, trust, the whole idea of trust. And, um, uh, you know, if people, there's a trust relationship, there's more going on in that school or uh, as leaders we're succeeding. Um, and trust means not connection with a group but with an individual. Uh, he's talked about a lot of things among them. Um, flexibility, um, responsibility, taking, you know, calculated risks. The staff under you can take calculated risks and feel safe to do so. Um, so uh, that they feel uh, that you listen to them and you allow them those opportunities. So they're not just surviving. And they're doing just barely enough to keep their jobs. That, you know, job needs to be just karna. So they're actually doing a lot more. And then how do you ensure they do? Then... Um, uh, so that means a lot of things, and he's given those uh, things, clarity and expectations, small things of recognition, lunchtime together, uh, finding out even a survey he did, which I found fascinating, you know, of uh, what you think about me as a leader and what can I improve or what, you know, anything about me that you think as a leader, good and bad, whatever. And then putting it in a table, I thought that was pretty amazing uh, as an XXX. And so knowing, like, in your Facebook, you know, you get to know, uh, or Lincoln, you get to know, uh, about your, uh, what people think of you, and here's, you know, a very nice way that he's uh, done it. Um, so many things. I mean, it's just like the blind, unknown, open, and hidden. That was awesome. Um, so it's like uh, what things you're blind to, being, being open to, figure that out and find that out, uh, because there are going to be certain things that don't, uh, that will be in the unknown as well. So what? to the extent uh -huh. things are known, uh, is better. I hope I'm getting this right. Yeah, no, that's right. I think one okay. of the things that people often ask me about is um, uh, uh, they ask for advice about how do I deal with that 
a very difficult member of staff who doesn't seem to get what it is we're trying to do. Uh, or that difficult parent. I was advising one of my colleagues earlier this week about a parent who's um, complaining uh, about what uh, decision they had made about their son. Um, and the uh, thing I uh, often say to people is that uh, uh, you, uh, you observe the behavior of the parent or the difficult member of staff, and you try to react to that behavior, and, ob and often it is uh, reaction to the behavior, but the behavior doesn't tell you about what the feelings are and emotions which are driving that behavior. So the <coughs> key thing is to get beyond or underneath, if you like, the feelings and emotions. Why is it this person is being really difficult or uh, obstreperous or uncooperative? Um, <coughs> uh, can I unpack that? Uh, and uh, the way to do that, of course, is to try and ask them about it. How are you feeling about it? You know, the context in which you're sitting at the moment. And typically when you do that, people will talk to you about what's happening. They won't talk to you about their feelings. So you have to give them the vocabulary to talk about their feelings, because none of us like talking about our feelings. Uh, so you have to give them the vocabulary. Uh, and very typically in a conversation I have, it's often the last 30 seconds in the conversation where the real reason comes out. So just, just let it happen, yeah. and it will come out. And then you can start to address the feelings and emotions. And of course, those feelings and emotions are driven by their personal needs. Okay, so what's very interesting for us in India is that we have a very autocratic style of management. Yeah. We tend to, actually, this is the style we adopted, I think, from the British. Britain has moved on, clearly. You, you guys are far you in a different space, <laughs> but you left us with the triangle of being the boss and everybody under us. Yeah, you can say whatever so you like about the British bosses. because I'm not British, so that's fine. Okay, you're not British? No, I'm Australian. Oh, great. Okay, so you're, you're making change in England. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. We are still in the British mindset. We're all bosses and everybody else is under us um, in, a, in a very different relationship. Uh, we tend to think please correct me if it's not so, that if you don't control your staff and keep that distance between you and them, they're not going to perform. This is completely uh, opposite of what Mike is saying. Uh, uh, I, I'm saying that the two key elements are the clarity in what you're expecting and the standards you're expecting. That's where the authority comes in. Uh, uh, and then the other elements of flexibility, responsibility, rewards, are, are, are allow the person to get on with it. I think most organizations, it's not peculiar to you know, uh, Indian culture at all. Most organizations are hierarchical and they work on a command and control approach. Uh, and actually, the military moved away from command and control decades ago. Even military in Britain, has, Britain yep. has moved away. Yep. That's amazing. Yep. Military has also changed in Britain. Yep. What about our schools here? We, <laughs> no, I think you know, it'll be nice to hear your views. I'm trying to prompt some thoughts and uh, discussions from your point, because in India, we tend to be um, you know, not worrying about feelings as much, uh, the emotional side of things. We say, well, you, you better toughen up. This is your job. We are paying you. You better you know, rise up to it. And maybe it's so, maybe it's not so in your school communities, but definitely worth discussing if it is so, then maybe Mike has some kind of uh, thoughts to share with you yes. and with me as well. Thank can you so I, much. Can I ask a question? question? Please do. Can I ask yeah. a question? Yeah. Please. Thanks, Mike, that for a wonderful presentation. Okay. Pleasure. <clears throat> My question is regarding, you know, the emotional well-being. In India, 20 to 25 percent teachers are either diverse, single, deserted, or widows. Mm -hmm. And 20 to 25 percent children are coming from single parent families. Yep. How do you deal with this? You know, emotional and well-being and create a kind of happiness in the school environment? Uh, I think it's a really good question and uh, a really important question because the statistics in, in the Western world are, uh, in the UK are pretty much the same. So, uh, you know, lots of single parent families, particularly in the most disadvantaged areas uh, of the UK, uh, and, uh, uh, and at the other end of the spectrum, and I imagine it's the same here, Lots of um, uh, uh, parents who are both working incredibly hard uh, and actually are pr 
probably handing over their children to the school to do much of the parenting. Um, they, they are exactly the same. The, the, the stresses, I think, in the family are, are very similar. They uh, come out in different ways. So I think the key thing is, if you know that you've got a, uh, a, pe a, a colleague who's got um, you know, young children from a single parent um, family, or they've got elderly parents, that's increasingly common now, I find with colleagues who've got elderly parents who are needing really high level dependency care, uh, then the first thing you do is just recognize that and talk to them about it. Uh, and that's what you know, the conversation over lunch might be about. How are you getting on at home? You know, Good. What, what's it like? So that's what you're doing is acknowledging. You're giving them the opportunity to, to uh, give you more of how they're feeling. Uh, and you're acknowledging their context because that context determines their behaviors. And then you can begin to adjust what you expect of them. Yes. Nobody wants to come to work and do a bad job. Nobody wants to come to work and do a bad job. They all want to do a great job. So can you be flexible about what you're expecting of them? Often it is uh, a phase in their life. So it might be, I've got to look after my aged parents until they die. That might be the next five years. Yes. That's the reality, isn't it? Yes. Uh, so the next five years, I will do the best I possibly can. Uh, and that's really what they're saying. And what I'm suggesting as leaders is, we've got to say is, well, I accept that that is the context. So I'm not worried about it. I want you to play to your strengths, and I'll support you in playing to those strengths. And I will understand the context, uh, and I'll act with compassion. That's what you were saying earlier. Yes. So the best people I have come across, I was talking to somebody a few months ago, uh, and he said to me, the, my best boss was the person who on day two of my job discovered that my father had had a heart attack, and he said to me, leave your job, go away, look after your father until you are comfortable about coming back. Great. And that just showed huge compassion and trust. Yes. And we've got to be flexible enough to do that. Does that help? Thank you very much. Thank Pleasure. you, Mike. Okay. I think we should have lunch. All right, thank you very much. Can we give him a big clap, please? Thank you.